Welcome to the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. This is the next in our series on PrEP and we're very lucky to have Dr. Steckler back with us. I don't think Joanne needs much introduction to this group anymore. So Joanne, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, we were trying to figure out what we were gonna talk about with this session today. We had initially thought that we would do some frequently asked questions, but then at the Research for Prevention Conference that just happened in Chicago earlier this year, there was the report of a second case of probable prep failure, and I thought it was going to be very interesting to bring up some of the aspects of this case. I don't know if any of you are getting the the sky is falling questions from your colleagues and from your patients, but that is one thing that these cases of transmitted resistance and acquired resistance have generated for me in the PrEP conversation. So the sky is not falling. So for those of you who don't remember, the first case was reported at the Conference of Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections in Boston, I believe it was this year where a 43-year-old man who has sex with men who is in a serious serodiscordant relationship with an HIV positive partner, but who had an open relationship, started PrEP in 2013, was reported to have good adherence, and then in April of 2015, presented with symptoms that were felt to be consistent with acute HIV infection. And the issues that came up at that point were what is the person's adherence, and dry blood spot that was collected suggested the patient had had good adherence in addition to reporting that the patient had had good adherence. And this patient, again, this first case, had a highly drug resistant virus. You can see those mutations, NRTI, NNRTI, and INSTE mutations, which of course were not generated by him taking Truvada. And of note, this patient did not have the K65R mutation, which conveys resistance to tenofovir. So this was felt to be the acquisition and the failure of Truvada to prevent transmission of a highly drug resistant virus. Fast forward to earlier this year at this conference in Chicago where Dr. Grossman, who I believe was in New York at the time, presented the case of a 20s year old, again, male who has sex with men in a serodiscordant relationship with a partner who is on HIV medicines and undetectable. He, in late 2015, had his pre-PrEP HIV test, that was his last negative test, and a couple weeks later initiated Truvada for pre-exposure prophylaxis. He was reportedly doing well, but couldn't get in for follow-up until after four months, of course going back to the guidelines that are recommending that people only get three months of Truvada at a time before they have their first HIV test. He needed one more month to get him to his appointment, which was on May 3rd, so just after four months, and at that point, his fourth generation antibody antigen HIV test was reactive. At that time, he reported receptive and insertive anal intercourse with his primary partner, who again was undetectable on HIV meds, as well as condomless insertive anal sex with non-primary partners in February of that year and March of that year. So just wanna walk you through the HIV testing for this case because I find this very interesting. On May 3rd, that four month follow-up, he had a reactive fourth generation test. His multi-spot, his supplemental test was non-reactive and he had a qualitative RNA test that was reactive. At that point, he was felt to be possibly an acute HIV infection and so they brought him back for follow-up testing. And at this point, things began to get a little bit confusing. So two weeks later, he again has a reactive fourth generation test. His multi-spot remains not reactive and his qualitative RNA is again reactive. What's really interesting is that his quantitative RNA test had a signal detected, but at under 20 copies. And this was the information that we had at this time. The Western blot results, which you can see in the lower row, came back later. So the first question is, is he HIV infected? And I think with a fourth generation test that is positive and a reactive RNA test, you can be call him a confirmed infection. But the question is, why, why is he undetectable effectively on Truvada? And then the question is, is this Truvada impact on his <coughs> HIV acquisition or is he one of those folks who was destined to become an elite controller? And, and I think we're never gonna know the answer to that. But one of the things I found interesting was that his Western blot, which is no longer commercially available and had to be sent to a specialty lab, was effectively positive, missing the P31, so in Febig stage five, but he, this is not an acute infection. This is someone who's been infected for some months. So 
we're going to talk a little bit about HIV testing right now in PrEP because I think that the more PrEP that we're doing, the more information that we're gathering about HIV testing and how to do HIV testing in PrEP. And one of the things that's become clear to me is that oral fluid testing in PrEP is really something that should only be done as last resort. In fact, the guidelines say don't do it. And one of the reasons for that is what you see in this initial study that was done by Marcel Curlin, presented at CROI this year. I haven't seen this published yet, but he described the oral fluid testing results in patients in several PrEP and other cohort trials, and they identified 208 false negative oroquic oral fluid results among almost a third of their seroconverters in those trials. And how they did this is that they took their first positive oral fluid test and then did a look back at specimens that had been collected and identified the first specimen in which the RNA was positive. And the median delay between oroquic oral fluid and that first positive RNA test was 98 days with one person remaining oral fluid negative for over a year after the first positive RNA test. So takeaway point, oral fluid testing, a big no-no in PrEP. Deborah Donnell from the University of Washington just recently presented at the same HIV research and prevention conference about delay, again, in the progression of HIV seroconversion among people who are on PrEP. And there was a slight delay in the FEBIG progression, which is a staging based on uh, antigen and then Western blot, and some delayed detection using finger sticks. So my take on point is always use the best test in people who are on PrEP that you have available to you, ideally a fourth generation test. Finger stick tests, okay. I love them if they were backed up by blood-based tests and a oral fluid test, big no-no. Okay, so testing and PrEP. Moving on, <coughs> so he, three weeks later, three and a half weeks later, is confirmed to be HIV infected and dolutegravir is added to his regimen of Truvada. Then two weeks later, again, reactive fourth generation test, multi-spot is non-reactive, his qualitative RNA is non-reactive <coughs> at this point, and his RNA is undetectable. His quantitative RNA is undetectable. You can see he's had some slight progression in his Western blot over these three weeks from FEBIG stage five to FEBIG stage six. So the number one question is, was he adherent to his PrEP? Because that's going to be the number one reason why people acquire HIV while on PrEP. He self-reported perfect adherence, which of course we know from the randomized trials how people over-report adherence. And then they sent measurements of his blood levels from dried blood spot as well as hair measurements on June 9th. Again, his first positive test was on May 3rd. He was probably informed of that about a week or so later. So this was about a month after his first positive test and after he was informed that he had a positive test. But these results were consistent with excellent adherence over the last one to two months. This is the information that we have. So felt to be adherent. And then the question always is, was this an infection transmitted from his primary partner? And I apologize that this slide probably doesn't project very well, but um, one of the things they had to do DNA sequencing because both he was undetectable as well as his HIV positive partner. And the take home from you can see from these are different parts of the viral region that the partner is number one, the patient is number two, and the partner in all of these sequences that they looked at looks more closely related to HXB2, which is really an ancestor virus, than partner one does to the patient partner two. So not a transmission from his primary partner is the take home point from that. And then again, looking at his resistance profile, this is the typo slide, where we did genotyping, they did genotyping on his proviral DNA, that they identified two mutations that are obviously gonna be key for Truvada, the K65R and the M184V, which is gonna convey resistance to Truvada, as well as additional NNRTI mutations. It's interesting to me that this gentleman had an undetectable viral load while on Truvada, given that this is what his DNA virus looks like, but that's another topic for discussion. But he had a multi-class drug-resistant virus. So this is where the sort of prep naysayers go, oh my gosh, the sky is falling. This is what we're going to see. Everybody's going to have drug resistance. And I want to just 
put a little realism in this second case. So one of the things you want to think about is how common is resistance to both Truvada, both of the medicines in Truvada, the tenofovir as well as m tricytamine And when I think about who is likely to get drug resistance, I want to go to the population of patients that are getting infected. There are other studies that have looked and thought about transmitting drug resistance that have looked at patients who are failing their antiretrovirals, but there is a mismatch between those. The patients who are failing antiretroviral therapy are not necessarily the ones who are transmitting. And so when you think about the what is the circulating new infections and what is the chance that my patient is gonna come into contact, you wanna look at what infections there are circulating in the population. And so this is data from the CDC jurisdictions that are pro participating in molecular HIV surveillance. The, the title of this project has changed so many times in the last 10, 20 years, but currently they are molecular HIV surveillance and what this is is our, our CDC epidemiology collecting the genotyping sequences that are done as part of clinical care, getting that information from the laboratory, and looking at that information for sort of identifying what transmitted drug resistance is existing in, the, in our communities. And so this was a study that was presented at the drug resistance workshop last year, and they were focused on Truvada drug resistance among men of sex with men. And so they picked a sample of not about 9,000, almost 10,000 men of sex with men who are newly diagnosed between 2010 and 2012, so pre-PrEP era, who are over 13, who were in a molecular HIV surveillance jurisdiction that had sequenced data for over